Shabbat Shalom, friends and brethren. Hi, this is Jeff Patton coming to you for a COG webcast sponsored by the Judeo-Christian Foundation. Well, what's the, pro what's the payoff for professing Christianity? You know, in our world this day, you look at any of the polls, where fewer and fewer people are professing uh, some sort of belief in Christianity, uh, confession of that the Bible is an authoritative guide to, to life. Fewer people are doing this. So what is the payoff for professing Christianity? Why is it worthwhile to do that? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19 in the Gospels in verse 16. Matthew 19 and verse 16. We'll answer that question right up front. Matthew 19 and verse 16. And someone said to him, this was a young man who came to him. He was rich. And he had, you know, he was a ruler. He was a, had, a, had a position of leadership in society. Someone came to him, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what essentially good thing shall I do to obtain eternal life? That is eternal salvation in the Messianic kingdom. That's the question. Because that's really the question when one is asking, what's the payoff for professing Christianity? Well, isn't it talking about eternal life? You know, this is something that the scriptures have been talking about, you know, when you, when you look at the scriptures right from the earliest times. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5 in the expanded Bible version. The Bible says... Right here, this is in the, obviously, this is in the law of Moses. There was this teaching, this understanding, and it said, Leviticus 18 and verse 5, expanded Bible version again, obey, that is, guard or keep my laws, God was saying, his statutes, his ordinances, his requirements, and rules, his regulations. And it makes this point. Why do you do these things? Why do you do what the Bible says is good and not do what the Bible says is wrong? Well, it says, a person who obeys them will live because of them. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You know, that is, you know, my seal of a surety. That is, and it's an authoritative statement that if you keep my instructions on what is morally and ethically right and should be done and don't do the things that should not be done, well, he says, you know, he has, a, there's this promise that was given. It says, a person who obeys them will live because of them. What does that mean? Let's go back to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, and let's pick it up here in verse 17. Again, I'm staying with the Amplified Bible version. And Jesus answered, okay, this question, what is the essential good thing I should do to inherit eternal life, to obtain it? Jesus said this, why are you asking me about what is essentially good? You know, this is typical of Jesus. He would answer a question with a question. What it, you know, there is only one who is essentially good. Okay, now he's not going to go into that saying, you know, only God is essentially good. God the Father is essentially good. He's not going to go into an explanation of that. But he said, but if you wish to enter into eternal life... What do you do? Keep the commandments. Now, that's shocking. That's shocking to a lot of people who think they understand Christianity because they just assume Christianity is whatever you do whatever you feel like, whatever makes you feel good. That's a lot of people these days, but that's not what it says. The scripture said, there is only one who is essentially good, and that is God, but if you wish to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Let's just, holy, we'll be back to that in a little bit, this thought. Let's go to now Luke 10 and verse 25. This was, the Gospels make a very strong point out of this particular item. Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, staying with the Amplified for a moment. A certain lawyer, that is a person who is an expert in Mosaic law, 
stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, this was the foundational question that they were looking for an answer. What do, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responded, he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Again, he's answering your question. You know, what do you what do you think it says? What does the script what do the scriptures say what you have to do to inherit eternal life? Because that's the issue. That's the payoff that they were seeking. And the lawyer replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this habitually and you will live. You do this, you practice, you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, to love your neighbor as yourself, doing always those things that are to the benefit of your neighbor. Do it habitually, Jesus said, and you will live. Now, that's the kicker. It's an unspoken corollary to what Jesus said here. You know, there's a kicker to it. Because how are you going to habitually do that? How are you going to maintain that? The problem is what the King James Version in this translation of the Greek calls, uh, in Romans 8, he calls it, the problem is the carnal mind. For, you know, Romans 8, verse 6 puts it this way, and I'm going to cite the King James Version here. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This contrast, because the carnal mind is enmity. That means it's hostile against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's a more modern translation. Uh, the New Living Translation puts it this way, Romans um, 8, verses 6 and 7. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit, that is God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature, or as King James translators put it, the carnal mind, is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. So if you're going to love God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your, your neighbor as yourself, and you're going to do this habitually, <laughs> you've got to move beyond the carnal mind. You have to let the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, control your mind to lead you on the path to peace and everlasting life. Has the gospel been preached in this world? Isn't the Bible the most published book throughout the world still to this day? Is God's truth available throughout most of the world? Yeah, it is, but yet we see, we know the influence of the Word of God on our current world, in our society, our governments, our institutions, and how we do things is fading. Fewer and fewer people believe that there is any serious payoff for those who are willing to profess that Jesus Christ is their Savior, or that the Bible, <laughs> the teachings of the Bible, authoritatively define what is right or wrong. Why is this? Why is this? If we could turn in the gospel, the gospel of John chapter 12 and verse 37. John chapter 12 and verse 37. One of the strange things, I mean, that you have in the gospels, you have all the accounts of the things that Jesus did, but there were many people who still didn't get it. They didn't perceive what was actually right before their eyes. John, the, God, the apostle John wrote it, and he said this way, verse 37, John 12, 37. But despite all the miraculous signs that Jesus had done, most people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. 
Lord, who's believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Verse 39, but the people couldn't believe. For as Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, in, including even some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear of the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. In the 21st century, you know, instead of the Pharisees, you know, in their long, you know, their prayer shawls and their tassels and things like this. Instead of the Pharisees, we have these days <laughs> the woke mob, whether it's on social media or occupying positions of government and the bureaucracy or many of our, you know, our, our culture's institutions and in education, health care, <laughs> you know, the law, <laughs> all these things. Anciently, you know, if you confessed in Jesus' society there in Judah and Galilee, if you confessed during Jesus' ministry that he was the Messiah, the Pharisees would expel you from the synagogue. Today, if you speak out against, for instance, critical race theory or COVID scientism with its only one version of the good of the vaccines or the effectiveness and safety of vaccines or mask wearing or lockdowns or perhaps the climate change agenda or even the World Economic Forum's plans or any other fashionable ide ideology revolving around these days, sex and sexual identities, the modern threat is from what we call cancel culture in all its nastiness. To deplatform you, do fire you, do persecute you, do smear you, do whatever, to lie about you right and left. As a consequence, many today, instead of pursuing what God calls righteousness and what the scriptures define as righteousness, instead they conform to various forms of what they, the woke mob's self-righteousness. It's things they come up with. Say, well, this is what we're going to show that we're good people because we have this stand, we do this and they do that. And of course, we're going to virtual signal by doing some act, some something that people can see so everybody can know what a great upstanding person in our tribe, in our community and people go along with it overwhelmingly. They want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their social standing among their peers. And the problem we have today, greatly throughout the Western world, is that people love human praise more than they love the praise of God. That's the essential problem we have in our society right now. But let's go back to Jesus' response to the young ruler who wanted to know what's the what's the payoff for being a believer a believer in the promises of the scriptures a believer in what the bible's narrative says back to Matthew chapter 19 in the latter half of uh, verse 17 but if you wish to enter into eternal life Jesus was saying, okay, if you want to do this, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. And the rich young ruler said to Jesus, you know, which commandments? I mean, after all, you know, we have, we, we have, a, we have, we have all the law of Moses. We have, what was it, 413 different commandments that, you know, some say these are the, these are the things that, you know, that we are required to do. Which ones, he said. And Jesus answered, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Line. Honor your father and mother. You know, he cited he cited a few of these. He's citing from the Ten Commandments, you know, as it was given in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, very famous. And then he also cited, and you, sh 
you know, you, and love your neighbor as yourself. Citing Leviticus 19, verse 18, you know, which makes the point loving your neighbor. Love means unselfishly seeking the best or higher good of others. Which is why you don't go around, you know, Leviticus 19, 18, don't take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor. Don't smear them. Don't lie about them. Don't trash their reputation. Matthew 19, verse 20, the young man said to Jesus, I have kept all these things from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered him, if you wish to be perfect... And here the idea is to have spiritual maturity that accompanies godly character, not having any moral or ethical deficiencies. If you want to be perfect, okay, go and sell what you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. It was an invitation to become one of his disciples. It was an invitation to believe in him, to trust in him to imitate his life, to walk as he walked, as he went away, and his, you know, and how he, how he did things. How he, this is to an invitation we all have as disciples of Christ. It's an invitation to walk and to live, to imitate Christ, do what he, do what he did. Verse 22, Matthew 19, 22, but when the young man heard this, he left grieving and distressed, for he owed owned much property and had many possessions. His problem was he had so many possessions, they were possessing him. He treasured his stuff more than his relationship with God, which is not what Abraham, who is called the father of the faithful in the Bible, did. Abraham was a rich man. <laughs> you know, the Bible makes a point out of it. He had a lot of possessions but he didn't treasure any of them more than he treasured his relationship with God. He was even when God put him to the test for his only son after he had waited for that child for all of his lifetime. He'd been waiting more than 20 years by the time when he had, had started his relationship with God to have a son to inherit his name, to inherit his, his relationship with God. He was willing to give up his son Isaac, when he was asked his most treasured thing in his life, but he was willing to do that because he believed that, you know, that even, you know, when God asking him to sacrifice him, he believed that God could raise him from the dead to fulfill his promises that he'd given him. He had that much faith in God. He treasured his relationship more than even his son Isaac. This is an attitude you know, the Apostle Paul had. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. I'm going to cite this in the Amplified Bible version. Philippians 3 and verse 7. But whatever former things, stuff in my life, all my career advancement, all the stuff I had done, and Paul, remember, was a, an academic, if you want to put it this way. He, he, you know, he, he was a fellow who was an intellectual leader. But whatever former things were gains to me, as I thought then, these things, you know, he said, which were once regarded as advancements and merit and achievement and in in what he was doing, I have come to consider as loss. Whatever former things that I had in my life, these things I've come to consider as loss, being absolutely worthless for the sake of Christ and for the purpose he's given me in my life. But more than that, I count everything as loss compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, as the Amplified Editors say, of course, when knowing this knowing means and growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with him, Paul found it a joy unequaled. He counted anything else 
as a loss in comparison to this priceless privilege and supreme advantage of coming to have this intimate relationship with Christ Jesus. For his sake, Paul writes, I've lost everything, and I consider it all garbage, refuse, excrement. You know, King James Version, I believe, says dung. So that I may gain Christ. Everything else, all these other things that might be taken away from me, from my profession, it's so what? I consider it all just lost compared to the, the excellency that he had of having this relationship with Christ. So let's go back to uh, Matthew again, to the rich young man. Well, I believe it's Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew 19. I didn't want to say 17. Matthew 19. Verse 23. Jesus said to his disciples, I most solemnly say to you, it is difficult for a rich man, you know, who clings to possessions and status as security. That's the amplified. So we, you know, yeah, they, for the people, yes, are, you know, are, it's difficult for somebody, for instance, like Elon Musk, <laughs> who clings to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's placing, you know, rich man places his faith and his wealth and his status. What Jesus was saying, that it was essentially is it was impossible for somebody who places their, you know, their trust and their faith and their wealth and their status to enter, you know, to into the kingdom of God, to reap the payoff for what it meant to be a believer. Now, verse twenty-five. When the disciples heard that this, when they heard Jesus say this, they were completely astonished and bewildered, saying, "Well." then who can be saved? Who can be saved from death? Who can be saved from, because they believed in God. They weren't atheists. Who could be saved, believed from God's judgment on the things they had done wrong? See, what Jesus said went completely against the common cultural understanding of that time. Indeed, it was a, a understanding that was actively taught by the Pharisees, that and the, you know, what the Pharisees said was that God bestows wealth on those He loves and chooses. Now they had some reason for that. They could look at the story of Abraham. Abraham was God blessed him with very many things. God blessed, you know, He He blessed Isaac, His son. He blessed Abraham's grandson Jacob. So they thought that you know that by having all the good things like it showed that God was blessing you and it was favorable to you. So when Jesus said, you know, this that he was telling this rich young ruler said, you know, look, your your possessions are possessing you. You're putting your faith in your in your wealth and your status. You you've got to you've got to lose them. Otherwise your 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 priorities are going to be all wrong. And when they heard that, it was, you know, impossible for a, a wealthy man who did this. You know, he just said it was possible for this man to, you know, be more, it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for such a person, a wealthy person, to enter into the kingdom of God. See, they, they thought that, well, if it's a wealthy person who's being blessed by God and a person who wasn't so wealthy, such as a poor fisherman like themselves or subsistence farmer or an average person who had to struggle to, to pay bills, that, you know, God wasn't blessing them. So how are they going to get into the kingdom of God? Who, is the, how, who, then, can, who, who then can be saved? Who then can enter into the kingdom of God? In verse 26, Jesus responded, Matthew 19, 26, looked at them and said, with people, as far as it depends only on them, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Jesus was, again, referring back at this point in time, yeah, to Abraham. 
you know, in Abraham in Genesis 18, where he shows up at the tent of Abraham and, and, and tells him that, well, yes, he's finally going to honor at this point in time the promise he had made to him. He's going to fulfill it, you know, many years before, a couple decades before. He says, I'm going to do it. And then Sarah, who's already, you know, Abraham's a real old guy. He's in his, you know, he's, he's in his late 90s. And Sarah is, I think, was around 90 years old. Long past menopause. You know, and Sarah, when she, when she heard this, she, was, she, she laughed to herself. And he you know, said, you're laughing. And she denied, she, said, she denied it because she was scared. And God said he was going to do this. He makes the point at that point, says, is anything too difficult or too wonderful for the Lord? At the appointed time when the season comes, you're going to have a son. And the point was, of course, the scripture made that there's nothing too difficult with God. And salvation is not too difficult for God. The ultimate payoff of what a profession of Christianity has, eternal life is not too difficult for God. Let's go to Romans, in the epistles of the apostle Paul, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Amplified Bible Version. Paul says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. See, at that point in time, Paul preaching the gospel, if he was among Jews, you know, they'd look at him and, you know, and they'd say, what are you talking about? You know, he's preaching this fellow as a Messiah who was crucified, you know. How, how can a Messiah have been crucified on, on a cross and all these other things? And when he speak to the Romans and the Greeks, you know, and they're, they talk about the resurrection from the dead, they say, you're talking fairy tales. But Paul continued to go around and preach. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. For everyone who believes, and, you know, believes that Christ is our Savior. To the Jew first and also to the non-Jew, Greek, Roman, whoever it might be. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith. You know, it's disclosed, the righteousness of God is disclosed in such a way that awakens more faith. As is written, forever remains written, the just and the upright shall live by faith. And of course, we have faith. You know, having faith means we're, we're believing something and we're acting on it even if we don't see it yet. In this world, we don't yet see the promises of God fulfilled. And to continue to be faithful to God and to live, you know, and to walk as in the, in the teachings of the scriptures, to follow the example of Jesus Christ requires faith. Because oftentimes in the world, we're not going to get what we call validation. We're not going to get support. We're not going to get help from maybe the people around us or the people at work. You stand up and say, no, that's, this is, you know, I'm not going to do this because this is not what the scriptures say is right to do. Or I'm not going to believe this or I'm not going to go along with this because that's not what the scriptures say. It's back to Matthew 19, verse 27. So, you know, who can be saved? <laughs> and Jesus said, it is impossible. With people, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. You, you can realize the payoff, what it means to profess, to make the confession of a believer. And Apostle Peter answered him, verse 27, and said to Jesus, Look, we've given up everything and followed you. You know, become your disciples and accept you as our teacher or Lord to do what you do, to, to, to stand with you, to take whatever abuse and ridicule, you know, that, that comes your way, you know, we get too, you know. What then will be in it for us? What's the payoff, Peter is asking? You know, it's, it's not necessarily, it wasn't always fun to be Jesus' disciples and hanging, you know, and hanging out with Jesus when he was persecuted. Because they, you know, they were class, they were lumped in with him. They were identified with him. 
Matthew 19, verse 28, and Jesus said to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, in the renewal, that is, because God promises to make things new again, to regenerate this world, to bring in the kingdom of God and restore the earth. In the renewal, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, yes, in the second coming, coming down to establish the kingdom of God when he has the power, the political power, to actually have things done, to end warfare throughout this world, to end the injustices that we see, the oppression that we see in so many places, to really get to the point of resolving some of the problems we have. I assure you, most solemnly say to you, in the renewal, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, you know, become my disciples, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Because, of course, God's going to fulfill all the promises he made in the Hebrew Scriptures to his covenant people that he chose, the descendants of Abraham. He's going to do that. Then he adds, verse 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or farms for my sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. You, Peter, you know, you've given up your profession. You were a fisherman. You had a boat. You were working with your dad in your, in your dad's business, and you gave it all up to do what I needed to have done. You might have done that, but you will inherit eternal life. And you will also receive blessings even in this world. But when is a question. Verse 30, But many who are first in this world will be last in the world to come, and the last first. Or as the New Living Translation said, But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. And those who seem least important now will be greatest then. We have a world that's topsy-turvy. And we have all sorts of people right now sitting in positions of power <laughs> who are teaching things that should not be taught, who are passing laws that should not be enacted. Let's go to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13 verse 26. Paul, towards the beginning of his ministry, when he had an opportunity, was there in the synagogue, and he was preaching this. He said to the synagogue, this was in Asia Minor, Paul in Acts 13, verse 26, I'm going to cite here the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Brothers, sons of Abraham race, and those among you who fear God, because in the synagogue services you had the God-fears, which were Greeks who had come, and they'd want to hear the scriptures read. They'd want to hear the law. They'd want to hear the prophets. They'd want to hear the writings. Because, well, you know, they understood that there was real value in that in comparison to what their society had to offer with all its paganism. You look at the scriptures, compare what the scriptures teach, compare what this world's teaching. Verse 27, for the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers, since they did not recognize him, they didn't recognize Jesus of Christ, were the voices of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled their words by condemning him. So there were the prophecies that Christ would suffer. You'd be the suffering servant. But they didn't understand this. They were blinded. Their hearts weren't open to what was going on because they were putting their trust in all sorts of other things. They put their priorities in things other than what the scriptures were, were teaching. So they fulfilled the words of the scriptures by condemning Christ, Adam crucified, and, and though they found no grounds for the death penalty, they asked Pilate to have him killed. Verse 28, 29, when they had fulfilled all that had been written about him, they took him down from the, from the tree, the cross, and put him in a tomb. Was that the end of the story? No, 30. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. 
And that is the story of the Gospels. When you read through all the Gospels, you see the resurrection of Jesus after his crucifixion. Matthew 28, 6. He is not here, for he has been resurrected, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. The resurrection of the dead was the theme of Apostle Peter's first sermon after he had received God's Holy Spirit there in Pentecost. It was a major theme of Peter's sermon. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held in it. Let's go back to Acts 13, verse 31. And he appeared, after he was raised, many days to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. The people who wrote the scriptures, the New Covenant scriptures, had this experience with Christ. They were willing to go the, the extra mile. They were willing to sacrifice because it, it was real to them. That is, they weren't, you know, they weren't getting any reaffirmation or support, you know, from most of society. No, they were actually persecuted. So we are now his witnesses to the people of his resurrection from the dead. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors, this promise of eternal life. And it was something that the Jews understood had been there from the scriptures. They knew it was, you know, that this there was something more beyond this physical life. And yeah, there's this, the commandments of God. Yes, they do. If we follow them, we don't have the same problems because we're not. We don't have the the bad things that happen to us because we transgress God's morals and God's ethics. That is the reality of the universe. When we live in harmony, things tend to go better for us. When we live in disharmony and we disobey these things, things go worse for us. But they knew that there was a promise. There was something that God would fulfill when it came to everlasting life. Turn with me to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. It's a payoff of the saints. Pay off of those who are God's people, who have a covenant relationship with God. The Lord took hold of me and was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. And he led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. And they were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? Now, that's quite the question. O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. He was playing it safe, Ezekiel. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with spirit. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. See, I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring you back to physical life from, the, you know, just from your dry bones. So I spoke this message just as he told me. And suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley and bones of each body came together and attaching themselves as complete skeletons. And I watched as muscles and flesh formed over the bones. You know, it's like... It's like some, you know, futuristic movie we would say, see right now where there have been more than one where you see them, you know, make an, an, um, an avatar or something like this. Science fiction movie. Then skin covered, uh, formed to cover the bodies, but they still had no breath on in them. He said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies that they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old, dry bones 
all hope is gone. Our nation is finished because they had disobeyed God so many times repeatedly. And they recognize their guilt. They recognize they had made a mistake. Is that, had that been the end of the story? No. Verse 12, then prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people. I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Yeah, I've, you were punished because you did not obey me. But it's still, nevertheless, I have a covenant <laughs> with you. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. When it actually happens, then you will know the reality of God of his covenant, of his promises, of the fulfilling what he has said. Verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. God is saying, you know, I'm going to do this. He's not asking for your permission or my permission. He's not asking that these people, you know, all of a sudden, have, you know, become what they were not. He's going to have mercy on them. He's going to show grace to them. And he will, he said, I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land, the promised land. And then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken when he has accomplished it. Paul preached the gospel, but many people didn't want to hear it. It was not the message they wanted. Acts 26 and verse 6. Paul being here and talking about, he was making a confession. He said, and now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day, King Agrippa. I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? This was something that made a difference in that time. You know, it got people upset. The gospel message of what had happened to Jesus, what was possible for believers, what was the payoff, the reward of those who would repent, turn to God, who would believe the gospel. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I'm declaring to you, brethren, the same gospel that I proclaim to you, which you also received and in which you are now standing. I'm talking to the Corinthian Greek brethren. By which you are also being saved. If you are holding fast the words that I proclaim to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Without any effect. We, if we are Christians and we're professing our faith, we must hold on to it. For in the first place, I delivered to you what I had received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to over 500 brethren at one time, of whom the greater part are alive until now, but some have fallen asleep. You know, some had died, been buried. Next, he appeared to James. Okay, that is his half-brother, and then to all the apostles. And last, he appeared to me also as one who was born you know, out of time. For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not even fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul, he, he, he had been very hostile hostile to the gospel, to the whole message that you know Jesus was the Messiah. He had been crucified and had been risen. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. Rather, I have labored more abundantly than them all. However, it is not I, but the grace of God with me. Now then, whether I or they, so we preach, and so you have believed. But if Christ is being preached that he rose from the dead, how is it that some among you are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because they even had that thought back then. We have plenty of atheists these days in the common attitude. How is it they're going to have, you know, a resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection from the dead, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain, worthless. And we are also found to be false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if indeed the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. But if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have then perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most miserable. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. He has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruit. In other words, the, it's just like if you have any uh, knowledge or, or experience with fruit trees, you have the first thing that ripens, but the tree is full of other fruit that will, come, that will follow. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, because Adam sinned, he did not follow what God was saying. He was under no compulsion, but he, he rebelled. He didn't do what he was asked. He turned his back on God in that way. For as in Adam all die, but however so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ that is coming, and afterwards the end comes, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to him who is God and Father, and when he has shall have put um, an end to all rule and all authority and power. The governments of this world are going to come to an end. If you're putting your faith and trust in them just in this life, what do you have? The promise is that it will come to an end. Verse, 20, uh, verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 15, For it is ordained that he reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And Paul goes on to argue, writing to the Corinthians, that, you know, I really believe this stuff. I believe the witness I'm giving to you. I believe in the resurrection of the dead, verse 30. How is it that some people say there's no resurrection of the dead? Why are we also in danger every hour? For there's for there you want, I die daily by our boasting, which I have in Christ Jesus as Lord. If I fought as a man with beasts in Ephesus, what did it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil companionship corrupts good behavior. Don't hang around with people and let them constantly feed you negative thoughts. Verse 34, Wake to righteousness and do not sin. For some of you do not have the knowledge of God, and I say this to your shame. Yeah, we, God has his standards of behavior. When we repent and we come into the church, we are to walk in according to his teachings, his commandments. You want to have life, you keep the commandments. Practice, make a habitual practice. Nevertheless, someone will say, how are the dead raised and what body would they come? Fool, what, do you, uh, what you sow does not come up to life unless it dies, and what you sow is not the body that shall be. Rather, it is bare grain. Yet it may be of wheat or one of the other grains, and God gives it a body according to his will, and each one of the seeds his own body. Likewise, not all flesh is the same flesh. And he goes on in this whole thing, trying to explain and using this agricultural analogy. He sows grain and it comes up, comes up into new life. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. We die, we get old. 
They're buried, or these days more commonly cremated, and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. God transforms our flesh, this physical nature, into something that is spiritual. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Therefore it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, the first human being on earth, the last Adam became an ever-living spirit. And he makes the point, however, the spiritual was not first, but the natural and then the spiritual. And the first man is of the earth, made from the dust. The second man is of the Lord, made from heaven. As is the one made of dust, so is also those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly ones, who are also those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of our one made of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit, inherit incorruption. And he goes on, I show you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. We're not all going to die physical death, but we'll all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, you think of Revelation and all the last trumpets and the promises and, and, and the prophecy that actually John would write about 30 years later. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptibility and this mortal must put on immortality. Now when this corruptible shall have put on incorruptibility, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's the payoff. <laughs> That's the payoff for being Christian. We have a continuing life. That's why it's worth whatever you go through. To close, let's go to First John in, the, in the, one of the general epistles of the Apostle John. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what glorious love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. He raises up. He gives us eternal life that we should be his adopted children. For this very reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. No, Jesus' society didn't understand who he was. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is manifested, we shall be like him, because we shall see him exactly as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. This is our responsibility now in this lifetime. We are to purify ourselves. In verse 4, everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness, and you know that he appeared in order that he may take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Everyone who dwells in him does not practice sin. Anyone who practices sin has not seen him and has not known him. Little children, don't let anyone deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Let's go to Romans 8. Back to Romans 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been moaning together as in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only this, but we too who have the first fruits of the Spirit, which is, when we have God's Holy Spirit, we have a taste of the coming world to come. Even we groan inwardly as we eagerly await the sign of our adoption as son, that is, the redemption and transformation of our body at the resurrection of the dead. That's the payoff for, Christian, for making a profession of, of belief in Christ Jesus, making a profession of belief in the word of God. 
That is a that is an incomparable riches to have life everlasting. When someone says, "Well, you know," expresses doubt or skepticism, or they mock you, or maybe they cancel culture you because you stand up and say, "No, that this isn't right. This is what is right." Have faith, and remember that we have. <laughs> an, inc an incredible promise. There is an incredible promise of being a Christian, of being loyal to our Lord and Master. Let us hold fast and let us shine a light in a world that is blinded in so many ways.